This is Lee Forrester, TS, TCS Honcho. Time for another installment of Metal on Metal, TCS Talk. I'll be talking about op sheets today as part of my introduction to the TCS system. What are we going to address in this video? We're going to look at the purpose of op sheets. We're going to talk about units being assigned and unassigned. We're going to talk about the op sheet graphic and different types of op sheets. We're going to talk about task organization and command prep within the op sheets. Mission success for an op sheet, mission, fail, miss, uh, mission failure, rally points, and then finally some details of preliminary instructions, reserve alternates, digging in, and sort of the, the minor points of op sheets, some of the details. What is the purpose of these things? Uh, TCS games are really different uh, than other tactical games that handle World War II in that basic era in a number of ways. I'm, I'd like to combine arms. Uh, the way that it's treated in TCS, there's many things about the mechanics I like. However, the real signature feature of the TCS is this op sheet system, which Dean Essig created based on his own experience in the military, among, among other things. The purpose, as I mentioned before in the TCS, is not to have hidden movement. It's not to have partial or hidden intel. It's to, to really focus on the control of your units and not letting players have absolute godlike control of their units and what they do and how they respond. Because in actual tactical situations, it takes a time. It takes time for leaders to see what's happening, to issue orders and actually change focus, change momentum, etc. So op sheets are here to control your uh, units and to prevent rapid change of these things. So you can't just jump back and forth as you respond to what your opponent is doing with your godlike view of the battlefield. Op sheets are given missions. You, what you do is you have your units grouped in an op sheet. They have a specific task that you assign and they execute this task to the best of their ability until, until either they succeed or they fail. Now the purpose is not to micromanage your units. This is not a plotted movement system where every turn you have to dictate exactly what your units are doing. Instead, it gives general missions to the units, and within these general missions and the graphics that you write, you're free to use your units however you want. You can move them back and forth, assuming, of course, that they're not dug in and have to stay put. You can fire on the enemy. You can react within the confines of it, but you can't move whole formations clear across the map to other areas that aren't a part of their op sheet. How tight you guys control these op sheets will depend really on your play style and on uh, your opponent and how you want to enjoy playing the TCS games. Some people play these fairly loose. Some people like to control things more to make it more realistic and write more detailed instructions to their units. That's really up to you. So this is not, TCS is, is really an experience. It's a narrative game. It's not exactly a sandbox. Uh, you do try to win. There are rules. There are victory conditions. But it's not something that's so nailed down like a, a advanced squad leader, which has very, very detailed rules and is very tournament oriented. This is much more narrative oriented. And so there is some flexibility in the rules themselves, how tightly you want control op sheets. And that's something you negotiate with your opponent. Let's talk about assigned and unassigned units. Counters units are considered always to be either assigned or unassigned. They're assigned if they're on an implemented op sheet. If they're not on an implemented op sheet, they're unassigned and they have some disadvantages when units are unassigned. That means they're sort of between tasks. They're not really fully under command. They don't know exactly what they're doing. Unassigned units cannot be dug in. Dug in is a status units have that gives them a, a lot more protection, a lot more survivability on the battlefield. They can't do assault or overrun attacks. They cannot fire point fire actions or suppressive fire actions. They can respond, however, with overwatch. So they're not helpless, but they can't initiate fires on their own. They only respond to the enemy and they have to stay within five hexes of a rally point, which is determined on, on the unimplemented op sheet they're on. Infantry units and weapon units suffer a slight morale uh, mollus, a, a negative effect on the morale when they're unassigned. So what is an op sheet? It's a graphic. It's got a, either a whole portion of the map or, or either the whole map or part of the map on there. It contains a graphic part. It contains written notes. And if you look over here, you've got things like time, the type, size, task organization that are part of an op sheet, written notes, and failure instructions. So these are all part of a typical op sheet. Let's look at um, how these work. Here's the time. This is whenever you write up an op sheet, you have to write the time. And if there's multiple day scenarios, you have to put that in there. You put the type, the one of the four attack types we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. 
the size uh, represents how many formations are part of that. I'll describe that in just a few moments as well. The task organization has all the units that are part of this. Now, this has to be very clear. There have, have to be no doubts about who is on what op sheet because every counter really needs to be on an op sheet, either an implemented one or an unimplemented one. The written notes should, in the level of detail you've agreed upon with your opponent, dictate what all is going on. So in this graphic here, you've got some units moving along this axis, some moving this one, some doing that. Usually you'll probably put, you see here you've listed who is part of which axis and what's going on there. There are no rules in the game about how fast you have to implement an op sheet. So if you're on an attack, that doesn't mean everyone has to charge forward instantly. You can hold them back, but they can't go moving around. If you're in group trout, you can't decide you want to go over here because there's a hole in the enemy line you want to do that. That's not a part of your graphic and the op sheet controls your ability to do that sort of thing. Every op sheet also explains what to do when the op sheet fails and that will I'll talk about in a little bit later that's your call when you decide things aren't going well you want to give them some new plans you can declare the op sheet a failure everyone will execute their failure instructions here it's returned to the line of departure and there's a rally point that's specified which I'll talk about again in a minute so the four types of op sheets are prepared defense attack hasty defense and move. Those are listed in order of difficulty to implement them. That is, prepared defense takes more time than attack, takes more time than hasty defense, takes more time than a move. Uh, prepared defense uh, limits units to being in a specific area and it, once a prepared defense op sheet implements, that is once it's legal, once it's in force, then every unit that you want to have dug in becomes dug in. I'll talk about that in a little bit later. So that's a nice benefit of prepared defense. It's the only way to get your units dug in. Attack allows you to move into enemy positions functioning full, fully. Hasty defense gives you an area that you defend. This particular op sheet is a zone defense with some fallback lines, but it can also be an area defense that's sort of up to you. It's like a prepared defense, but you don't get to be dug in. And the, the, so that's the downside. The upside is it's much, much faster to implement a hasty defense. A move op sheet is a very quick one to implement. It's just getting your troops from one point to the other, but they're not fully prepared for battle. And if they're in a move option, implement a move option, you still treat them with the penalties of being, of, of being on an unimplemented, of being unassigned. So you don't want to use a move option to go through enemy lines or your troops are going to be extremely vulnerable. It's really designed for rear area moves, getting around. So if you have a large map, you want to get around here, back to somewhere else where the enemy isn't, a move option can be the best option for that. When you list the task organization on that option, make sure all the units are there. A unit can be off the map. It doesn't have to be on a map. So reinforcements or units that haven't arrived yet can be on an op sheet. That's fine. Most games, TCS games, do not assign artillery units. Those are off map things. Those are usually more flexible, but there are some games where they want you to put artillery on the op sheet as well. A unit can be on the maximum of two op sheets at the same time, only one of which can be implemented. So a unit can never be on two implemented op sheets. Often what happens is it'll start on two unimplemented op sheets. One of these op sheets will implement, the other one will continue, and that way you've got something to start implementing if your first op sheet that they're on fails or succeeds for some reason. And you create op sheets before the game with all your troops if you want, or during the command phase of every turn, you can begin to create new op sheets. Command prep. This is the process of accumulating what's called weighted turns for each op sheet. That is the longer, the more game turns, you spend planning and to try to implement this, the better your chances of getting one of these op sheets to implement. There's a die roll for that that I'll explain in a minute. Command prep begins at the instant that you create an op sheet. So this create one was created at 1020. That's the beginning of it. Um, each side in a scenario, and this will depend on the game specific rules, has what's called a command prep rating. That's a number from one to seven generally. The lower the number, the faster the formations are. That means they're either they have good commanders or they're very experienced, they're veterans, etc. And then it's not going to take them so long to change momentum. It can also do with national army types. So in general, in the World War II games, you'll find that the well-trained German formations will have a prep rating of around two or three, which is pretty good. Some of the Soviet formations have a lower one, five to seven, depending on their flexibility. So it takes them longer to change course. The op sheet size is a function of how many formations, different formations are on the op sheet that have their own morale box. It's usually going to be for infantry formations, infantry battalions, and for vehicles, they're going to be vehicle companies generally. So each game will have a, a morale chart and we'll show, and we'll, we'll talk about that, those things later in the series too. 
showing how many which battalions are subject to battalion morale and which vehicle formations are subject to vehicle morale. Each of the elements from each one of those things adds one to the size of an op sheet. In other words, the more troops involved, the more formations involved, the larger the op sheet, and that's also going to add to the time it takes. There is a staff modifier if you have one full battalion or one full vehicle formation on the op sheet, then uh, you subtract one from the size. So here's a look at how weighted turns are accrued. Each turn uh, during the command phase that you're working on these op sheets starting the turn after you actually wrote them up, you assign weighted turns depending on the status of the units and use the unit with the worst status here. So if these units are unassigned, they're mainly working on trying to plan what's going on, they get three weighted turns. If any of them are assigned to another op sheet, or if any of them are executing preliminary instructions, or if it's at night, you can accrue a maximum of two a turn. If any of your units are fired on, so you're close to combat, and someone is actually fired on whether it's effect or not, you only accrue one turn, so that slows the process down. If the op sheet consists solely of vehicle units, you're on a vehicle op sheet, consider this perhaps a tank company of some sort, and you get three times the weighted turns because these units were able to change tack much more quickly than, than infantry units. Now, if you look at this table, what you do is you look at the type of the op sheet you're trying to implement, and then you add the command prep to the op sheet size, and that will give you then the column you need to roll on the D11 to 66. So if your command prep is one, and you have a zero size, which can be if you have one full battalion, and that gets the, the benefit of a minus one, so it's zero, then it's gonna be pretty fast. Even if you just have one way to turn, you've got a pretty good chance to do it. If, however, you're a Soviet infantry regiment, that has three full battalions in it. That's going to be a size two. There's three battalions minus one for the for the benefit of having a full battalion. And if your command prep is five, that's going to give you a command prep and op sheet size of seven. And if you're trying to implement a, a prepared defense to get a decent chance over here, that's 49 weighted turns. So even at the maximum, if you're unassigned, that's 13 turns of waiting before you can sort of get a chance of making the roll. So this is, it's a table to be well aware of because if you, when you look at your forces when you're playing the game, you have to understand how quickly can you react to what your opponent is doing. Implementation and failure. Uh, if Once you implement an op sheet, it, becomes, it stays implemented until one of two things happen. You declare it a success, and that happens when you fulfill what the purpose of the op sheet. And this is a little funny because um, what happens obviously is when you declare success and the op sheet's over, your units are now unassigned. So that's not always a benefit to you. But the spirit of the rules is such as if you've ordered units to take a hill and you take the hill, declare the op sheet success. Don't just keep saying you're working on capturing empty hexes in order to stay assigned. Uh, what you should do is, of course, have an unimplemented hasty defense op sheet going at the same time. And then once your attack op sheet is over, once it's succeeded, start rolling to implement your other one your defensive op sheet, which hopefully has been accruing weighted turns during this time and won't take so long to implement. If you decide that you're not going to succeed at this thing, you can also declare it a failure. That's your call. You're never forced to. There aren't die rolls in the TCS that make your roll for failure for op sheets. It's up to you. When, you're, when you fail an op sheet, the units have to then execute their failure instructions and head back to the, to the rally point. Hopefully you've got another op sheet in the works already developing to give your units a purpose. <laughs> So a few issues with handling. These are in the rules, so feel free to look those up when you need to. If you have a unit on an implemented op sheet and it's on an unimplemented op sheet, which then implements, is breaking the rules now. It can't be on two implemented op sheets, so scratch it out of the first one, and it's considered part of the second one. If you want to add units to an implemented op sheet, so you've got one going and you want to add a different... Um, battalion, add it in something from reinforcements, or move it over some, some, some other part of the map. Well, obviously not wipe them in, write them in. Uh, then you can start accumulating waiting turns just for that formation. So not the other one. The other, the original formation, the option that's implemented stays the same. So if I'm adding a battalion uh, and my prep rating is, say, three, then the size for a battalion is one. I'm going to subtract one for the battalion modifier for minus one, the bonus, at zero. So I'm going to start ac accumulating weighted turns just for that group. So they're going to be like an op sheet within an op sheet. And I'll roll for that every turn. So it'll take them a while to join it. Once they join, and when you when you add them to the op sheet, you have to write the graphic in immediately. You don't wait till they implement to write the graphic. You do the graphic right away. You've committed to it. And then you have to keep rolling until they're actually able to join that. They're unassigned until... Uh, they actually implement on that op sheet. 
Now, if you have an unimplemented op sheet that's accrued some weighted turns and you want to add units to it in midstream, what you do is you recalculate the new size based on the newly added units, then divide the old size by the new size, and that's going to give you a ratio that's below 1. Suppose before an example we've got a Soviet infantry regiment that's got a size 2, you know, three battalions minus one for the staff modifier, that's two. And then we add another battalion, that's two over three, then it's going to be two thirds. Or like I've given you right down here, suppose we have a size one op sheet, and then we add another one so that it's size two, that's going to be one over two, 50%. So that's going to have the weighted turns I've accumulated. So essentially bringing in some new units dilutes the weighted turns that you have if it's on an unimplemented op sheet. Sometimes it's better to just write a new op sheet for them to do something else. It, of course, depends on what you're trying to do. Some other issues with op sheets, reinforcements, units you know, that are coming in off the map. Every At the beginning of a game, you can give any reinforcing unit, uh, you can give them an implemented op sheet at the very beginning of the game. Or you can decide you need to wait and see how things develop. You can create op sheets for reinforcing units any command phase. You do not have to wait till they get on the map. You can start playing in this well ahead of that. And in fact, sometimes uh, when I play, I start with op sheets and then I'll start second implement and then I'll start with unimplemented op sheet just to see how things develop and I may try to implement that and even do another one all before the units even arrive. So that's one way to try to adapt to what's happening on the map with your reinforcements. Remember, once again, being off the map does not affect your ability to be on op sheets. You can write op sheets for any units that appear in the game at any point. Uh, you don't have to wait till they're actually on the map. Reserves are a special uh, section that these are, gives you some flexibility within an op sheet. So if we have an op sheet, we can designate up to 50% of the counters on that op sheet to be in reserve. When they're in reserve, they can't act, they don't have any plan, they're treated as unassigned, but I can write in what I want them to do. Uh, I can decide after the op sheet's implemented and I can wait and see how things develop. And then in a certain command phase, I may decide, okay, I have to send my reserves in. At that point, I write on the graphic what I want them to be doing. I put a note in terms of what their plan is. So this is actually changing the op sheet during the course of the game after it's been implemented. And then I have to make an implementation die roll on a D6 to get them to do this. Basically, you have to roll their prep rating or less on, on a, or more. Yeah, sorry, on a D6 to get them to do that. So if their prep rating is one, they're, they're, it's pretty easy to get them to go. If their prep rating is seven, they can't actually use reserves because there's no way to make that die roll. So the, this shows that f formations with better command and control have more flexibility if you put them on reserve. Units on reserve can't be a prepared defense. And in order to get them to go, and when you, when you create the op sheet in the beginning to have reserves, you have to roll to implement the whole op sheet on at least the attack thing. So even if it's a hasty defense op sheet, if you have units, you want to have units on reserve, you have to implement it as if it were an attack op sheet. And that's because reserves can implement attack orders if they want. They can do anything from hasty defense to attack. Just remember, the mission of any reserves on op sheet have to stay within the scope of that op sheet. It cannot be something like, okay, go to a whole different area of the map and do, do this. That needs a whole different op sheet. So reserves are sort of gives you local flexibility. And I would say, um, as you get better at the TCS, ability to use reserves will give you an edge over your opponent. If you think about how to, how much, how many units to keep in reserve, how to use them effectively, that can give you an edge in terms of the command control and ability to respond um, over someone who's just starting out in the TCS and doesn't know how to use these. So here's an example of an op sheet with some reserves. This is from Canadian Crucible, the very first scenario. Um, the Germans with a, a basically a battalion are trying to take Nore en Bessin, or however you say that. And with the starting units, they've got two platoon, well, two groups here going this way, going that way, two companies. And then they've got a fourth or third group right here that's in reserve on this op sheet. So here, this is an attack op sheet, size zero because it's a battalion minus one. It's got a few extra vehicles and support uh, that don't count to the, the size. Here's the failure instructions. But this group here is hanging out in town. They're treated as unassigned on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. We can decide we want to maybe go around the flank this way or maybe support something that's going on here. It just depends on how the battle develops. We might find that the Canadians are all on this side, so we want to send them this way. And uh, the German prep rating, I don't remember what it is in this game. I think it's around three, might be four. So that'll give them a nearly 50-50 chance of being able to implement that turn-by-turn. -turn. They have to keep rolling. Once they commit, I'll draw a graphic in, show what the plan is I want them to do. 
then I make it that every time in the command phase, I make an implementation roll on a D6 to see if I can get those guys to begin executing their part of the plan. Alternates is not used as often as reserves. When you create an op sheet, you can put an alternate route for each unit or group of units and make a decision during the game, do I want to send these units on this alternate route or not? And then you implement that with a die roll check just like you do with reserves. Once you decide to do this, you can't undo it. And it can be unfortunate if your prep rating is not good, you start getting your guys to do alternates and you fail the die roll turn after turn after turn and they're just stuck there trying to <laughs> get their act together and, and uh, get themselves lined up to go the way they weren't planning on going right away. Here is an op sheet that shows some alternates built in. This is the main axis of attack. This is an alternate route that specified when the op sheet is written, who can take it, that's all written in here. And if these units are hanging out here seeing how this attack develops, remember you don't have to execute an attack full speed, you can be slow if you want, these units can decide, well, we need to go here to help out, so we'll start making our alternate die roll. We'll commit them to taking the alternate, and hopefully within a few turns, they can then take their position at Maple and, and put down suppressive fire on a smallville in order to help the main Axis Elm attack come off well. Last thing really to talk about here in op sheets is digging in. Digging in gives your units defensive bonuses. It only happens the instant you implement a prepared defense op sheet. You don't have to roll for implementation on an op sheet every turn. That's something I failed to point out earlier. Often, if you've got a group of units that are trying to implement a prepared defense, you want to make sure they all get into the position you want them to be in first because you don't want this to implement when they're on the way because they dig in instantly where they are. Uh, anytime a unit moves out, they lose their uh, the hex that they're dug into, they lose their dug-in status, and you can mark them with a not dug-in counter. It depends. You can use these counters as you need to to show who's dug in or who's not dug in. It depends on how many are are there and uh, you know how difficult a thing it is to manage. Now, one thing is you get better at the TCS to remember is the one, two, three punch. Suppose you need to attack an objective. You, you work on an attack op sheet, you have an attack op sheet implemented, and then at the same time, you have a defense op sheet gathering weighted turns, a hasty defense one usually, so that when the attack succeeds, your hasty defense is on that objective, and then hopefully it will only take you a few turns to implement a hasty defense so that you guys can, can defend that area without uh, being subject to all the negative effects of, of being unassigned. When the hasty defense op sheet implements, start working on your prep defense uh, op sheet so that you can dig into the area you're holding there. And hopefully in 10, 15, 20 turns, assuming the units are still there, they'll actually be able to dig in. So that's sort of a normal process of using op sheets to get onto objective, defend the objective, and then dig into the objective. All right, what did we talk about? We talked about the purpose of op sheets, how units are assigned or unassigned, depending on whether or not they're on implemented op sheets or not. We looked at the op sheet graphics and the information that has to go there, the task organization. We talked about command prep, that number that each army has of how quick it is to implement new orders. We talked about mission success and failure, the need to have rally points in your failing instructions so there's units hang out around there. And then all these extra handling issues with, well, actually, I didn't talk about preliminary instructions. Uh, let me get, add that real quick. And that is... When you have an attack op sheet going, you can put in preliminary instructions, which can get your units to line up to take the objective more quickly. This gets your units moving out to their line of departure before they actually execute the attack. So I would just refer you to the rules to, to read more about that. We talked about reserves, uh, how flexible they are. They're the mark of an experienced TCS player. Alternates, which are useful sometimes, and then digging in. After this op sheet, we'll be moving to, uh, after this video, we'll be talking now about line of sight and spotting and observing. I fight with fire, with we also die.